So we wanted to welcome everyone to the Ledge Talk, and uh, thank you for coming. We are really grateful for this opportunity. And as we just said, my name is Pertis Moffitt. This is my colleague, Heather Fakowski. We're both from Aurora College. We're the academics in the project. And this is Lida Fuller. I think everybody here maybe knows all of us. <laughs> but Lida is our community partner. So we're all co-investigators in this project. Tonight we're going to share a, a research project that we have been conducting since 2011, along with partners in all three of the Prairie Provinces. And the main message that we hope to get across today is the nature of intimate partner violence against women in the territory and the community response as described by frontline workers. So we have come to recognize that our communities have compassionate service providers who are working to make a difference in the lives of women in the territory and that they are working in circumstances that are quite volatile and quite frustrating. Okay, so the agenda tonight is uh, to provide a bit of a background to you about the project, to talk about the methodology, to review the findings, and then describe some of the implications. And this is five years of work that we're going to present in 30 minutes. So bear with us. We were invited into this project by the principal investigators, Dr. Mary Hampton of Luther College at the University of Regina and Diane Delaney, community advocate from Saskatchewan. And they were successful in getting funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. So the team is composed of academics, of community partners, and students from Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and Northwest Territories. And we have Michelle Burke in the room, who is our research assistant currently and also two geographers, one from uh, Dr. Paul Hackett from the University of Saskatchewan and Dr. Joe Pawawar from the University of Regina. We also are guided by an elder, Betty McKenna, you can see her in the front of the picture there from out of Saskatchewan. In our jurisdiction of the NWT, we were also fortunate to acquire funding from Nazavik uh, opportunity to be able to employ social work and nursing students along with the other funding that we've had. So just a little bit about the project background. I think the effects of residential schooling on the health status of Indigenous people is well reported. Casper, in her examination of national data, identified that resident, residential school attendance predicted negative health status directly and indirectly through socioeconomic and community risk factors. Her findings support the need for building community capacity through psychosocial and economic resources. Ross and partners identified the link between residential schooling and alcohol problems in Indigenous populations in Canada. Many researchers have used a socio-ecological model to explain violence. There are factors at many levels, at the individual level, the family level, the community level, and society. For the individual, there are gender inequities and gender norms at roles at play that contribute to violence. And at the family level, there may be a history of family violence and social norms. At the community level, there may be social and economic inequities. There is a link between social determinants of health and family violence. Family violence is more prevalent in rural and remote areas because firearms are more available. There is a reluctance to identify family violence as a problem. There is a lack of mental health and social services. There is isolation or remoteness as a factor. Unemployment is high. There are housing issues. And the quality of education, along with poor school attendance, are occurring. <coughs> 
A particularly relevant quote that speaks to the relationship between the social determinants and family violence by McConan and Raphael will be shared with you. The primary factors that shape the health of Canadians are not medical treatments or lifestyle choices, but rather the living conditions that they experience. The research objectives short term for this project are to discover the unique needs of women experiencing violence from an intimate partner, document gaps that exist in meeting these needs, and create narratives and a theoretical model that describes ways that we create nonviolent communities. The long-term objectives were to create a model and action plan for sustaining nonviolent communities in rural and northern regions of Canada and to inform policy makers to maximize policy change and community action to implement findings from our research. In the project, the research team defined community within our logic model as a group or groups of citizens who have something in common. The community is the local frontline workers and their descriptions of responses and reactions to intimate partner violence within their geographical communities. The scope of violence includes physical, sexual, and psychological, as well as financial and spiritual acts of control and coercion used against an adult woman by a current or former intimate partner. The project was very interesting as researchers in terms of the methods that we have used over the last five years. Because as we, I'll explain through our model, each year the methods and the outcomes influence the following year so that the model grew from year to year. So in the, in the year one, our principal investigator, Mary Hampton, um, requested statistics from the National RCMP database for each jurisdiction of our project. And there were a number of intimate partner violent incidents per community as reported by the RCMP. Our research assistants did a telephone uh, and website survey across the NWT to document the relevant services available for women and families who are experiencing violence. So the outcome of year one was an NWT services report and um, we also used uh, geographic information system maps. So we formally published a service report and it's a time sensitive document but we're actually updating it, it's currently being updated. And the second outcome, the uh, geographical information maps, demonstrate both the RCMP data and the resources that are available in the territory. So the maps spatially demonstrate the communities, the RCMP, the victim services, where the shelters are, and then the number of incidents in each community. Seeing as I have year two on there, we used uh, grounded theory, and grounded theory is a method that is used to make sense of social interactions and interpretations that are attached to social symbols. So when you hear a theory like that, you can realize that when you're trying to look at what's happening in our communities in terms of community response, it's a very good fit. So the individual interviews in year two were a total of 31. And we interviewed RCMP, who were the majority of participants that we interviewed. There were 11 of them. Shelter workers, victim service workers, healthcare workers, social workers, as well as other relevant frontline workers. And the participants were, represented 12 communities. 22 were women, nine were men, 25 were non-Indigenous, and six were Indigenous frontline workers. Let's see. And out of that, we were able to identify a preliminary model of community response to intimate partner violence. So in this grounded theory method, we are 
collecting data and analyzing data in an iterative way. So we're going back and forth with both our questioning and our analysis. So our theory grows. And it entails, we transcribed um, audio tapes uh, and interviews verbatim. And then we pulled out new questions as the data is accumulating. And then reading through the transcripts to look at uh, meaning and to decipher meaning and to do line by line coding. And with that, we then were able to identify a community response. So in year three, we selected two different communities in the territory from which to study in more detail. So we used the year one and the year two data, and in particular, we used the GIS maps looking at the incidence of violence. And we tried as best as, as possible to fit with our other jurisdictions. And they were identifying a rural community and a northern community. And as you know, we are northern. <laughs> so we instead developed a criteria. So we looked at remote location versus a regional center. We looked at fly-in and road accessible communities. We looked at poorly resourced and better resourced and a northern and a southern location within the territory. So at that point, when we made a decision about the communities, we actually took it to our local research team, including LIDA, uh, RCMP, um, and also an Aboriginal uh, woman who is working with us and our students. And um, we identified the communities and then we uh, did two focus groups. We did 13 more additional interviews and we did a media scan. And we actually published that as well. So that is published in the Circumpolar Journal. So the outcome of that was to develop narratives, a narrative about a remote community and a narrative about a regional center. So those we will share. At the, by, by June, we're hoping that we'll have all of this out there. In year four, we continued uh, in a vigorous way our data analysis and our synthesis of findings. And we started to pull in literature to try to look for similarities and differences, what's out there, what's written, and um, use that to begin uh, an action plan. At the same time, we are working with the Coalition Against Family Violence, who spoke very eloquently today uh, in presenting their um, three uh, primary uh, goals to uh, MLAs here. And um, so we, are, we work with them as a partner. And we realize that we are the research arm and our hope is to develop a research agenda. Because with, with new research, we're going to take this even further. Year five is the time for uh, knowledge translation and dissemination. And uh, we have been sharing our findings the whole way along with the coalition. We've been out in the communities as well and uh, have done some teaching and sharing about violence. And we are targeting academic publications and conferences and our hope is to develop a plain language document as well that will go out to all of the communities. All right, so some of you may find this map familiar. It got a bit of a media coverage this past fall with CBC. Hopefully, we can just give you a bit more details uh, about what this map indicates. The map identifies the prevalence of violence across all of the communities in the NWT in a fixed point in time, between January 2009 to December 2010. It reports the total number of incidents, not in ratio to the, to the uh, community's population. If you were to look at that, you can just get a sense. If you look at the legend and you see that um, the largest range, the biggest color, is 251 to 500 
incidence. And you can see that the, the palest color is 0 to 25. And looking at some of those communities where you know there might be a population of two or 300 people, and the color is quite prominent, you, can, you get a sense of the seriousness of what's going on. The other thing uh, that you can notice in this map are the resources. And we have only highlighted the RCMP, the victim services, the women's shelters. Um, there are a few other resources, but in our study across the jurisdictions, these are what we're highlighting. And you will find uh, that the gaps are pretty much identified when you see that all of the communities are experiencing violence. The occasional one that isn't, it's how the RCMP are collecting the data. So this is a visual depiction of our finalized model. It shows the community response of frontline workers to intimate partner violence, which they consistently de describe to us as their hands are tied. In terms of stopping the violence or preventing the reoccurrence of violence, they feel there is little they can do. They also use this phrase as a way to express the way in which women feel in terms of responding to their own experiences of violence. They explain that women are putting up with violence, they're shutting up about violence, and they're getting on with life. So they talked about feeling frustrated and overwhelmed as frontline workers with regards to the frequency and the severity of violence, the prevalence of alcohol use, the sparseness of supports and resources to better help women, the geographic isolation and the historical impact of colonization. The effects of this were acknowledged as having an emotional toll on them personally. Quote from an RCMP member, you go to calls, there's a screamer in the house, you show up, clearly she's been hit, nobody knows anything all the time. Kids are crying, they are telling you to F off, get out of my house, the boyfriend, he didn't do anything happens all the time. They don't come forward with stuff. That's hard for us. You have to have a victim. You have to have a statement. Someone to corroborate what has happened. This is my biggest issue. I don't think they see a future possibility. I've gone the road, testified against my partner, and so I was threatened, and I recanted my statement. That's the cycle. Participants also describe the community response to intimate partner violence as though it is normal. They related that this response of normalcy and acceptance and as well a desensitization is one that they have recognized by community people as well as themselves as service providers. They talk about how they come to expect it and almost take it in stride as part of their everyday workload and of community members' days' lives. Another RCMP officer said, in my estimation, there is a prevalence of men and women in the North that thinks that domestic violence is just a part of daily life, and they have come to expect it, and they have come to deal with it, and the victimization continues. From their perspective, this comes from not being able to address the violence effectively, and that this ineffective community response stems from several contextual factors that we have identified in the lower half of this model. These factors we will describe in greater detail uniquely intersect to the, with the community as a response to the violence. I'm going to pass over to Heather now. So I'm just going to spend the next little while talking about some of the contextual factors that lead to this experience of uh, your hands being tied. Uh, social determinants include things like um, poverty, housing, unemployment, 
low literacy levels, and low educational levels. If a woman leaves her partner, particularly in a ro remote community, she's lost so much, including, including housing, which basically leaves her homeless. Uh, she's lost her partner, maybe her children, her family, her community, if she's had to leave the community to access an emergency shelter. Um, once she, her immediate needs for safety have been taken care of, she then is put in a position of trying to locate some housing, either in the larger center where she's, where she's found some uh, where she's found shelter or perhaps back in her home community and if that's not um, an option for her then maybe she's resorted to going back with her partner. A shelter worker described it in this way, when a lot of our women, especially in the smaller remote communities, come into the shelter they have an option of staying here or going back and either way housing is an issue. So if they go back to their own small community they have no other choice but to go back into their house often with the alleged perpetrator because there's no housing available and their name is on the housing lease with the partner. There are probably arrears owing to the housing too, so they can't just walk out of one house and go into another until the arrears are paid off, so they're on their own. If they get a house on their own and the partner follows them, then that creates another issue. So the biggest issue, I think, is the lack of accessible housing for many of our victims to go when home is not an option, so we need some transitional housing. And another quote that's on the, the screen there is talking about poverty issues with a lot of the women. Um, a shelter worker had said, I feel like the person who is their abuser is their only source of income. So they, number one, go to jail, or number two, they leave them and have no way to support their family and kids. So they don't press charges or they go back to these individuals because they feel that if they didn't, financially, they would be destitute. So uh, these are some of the GIS maps again. Um, these two maps are shown uh, here to demonstrate the travel distance to Yellowknife for women fleeing violence, both in the summer and the winter season. So the summer is on your right-hand side. Yellowknife was used as a central service point for obvious reasons. Number one, just because there's uh, the greatest amount of resources in the community. Uh, in the territory here, but as well just to have uh, something to demonstrate those distances at a, a single point in the territory. So as you can see on the maps, the greener and the lighter colors of yellow and orange indicate shorter travel time to Yellowknife, and then the darker red and the lighter pink colors indicate further time. So the, the darker red and the, the lighter pink colors are anywhere between 25 and 120 hours of travel time. What these maps are indicating when we think about remoteness is that it demonstrates, first of all, the importance of ice roads in the winter because you can see in these maps that the winter season, it, it's, the travel time is quite a lot shorter for women. So ice roads become an incredible resource for them in terms of um, accessing safe housing and shelter. Um, what it also then implies is that there's increased risks for women during the summer months um, and making it more difficult too for uh, frontline workers to support women who are trying to flee violence in the summertime. In addition to what the maps have provided, when we think about remoteness, participants explained as a woman experiencing violence, there is no anonymity. They're isolated and they're exposed to gossip and ridicule in, in, as an individual within that community and this becomes very socially isolating for them. One participant thought that it might feel as though there was nowhere to hide as a victim, he had said. In addition to what the women experience in terms of remoteness, participants also talked about their own experience of living in the more remote communities of our territory. Though they spoke about it being very beautiful and it almost being like frontier work, they also acknowledged the struggles of living and working in these areas. An RCMP member had described it as though you're not in the same world here. A culture of violence and silence is another major uh, factor that leads to this sense of your hands being tied as a frontline worker. And there's several, you can see several sub-themes emerged out of, out of this. Um, colonization and residential schooling has contributed to a more disruptive family life, including a loss of traditional male and female roles, uh, parenting, and understanding intimate relationships. Frontline workers have also felt that this is a barrier in terms of their ability to develop trusting relationships with community people. 
including women who are experiencing violence. They believe it contributes to women's hesitance in reaching out for help with service providers. A healthcare worker had said in our study, residential school, there's a huge legacy around that. And there's a legacy still around healthcare providers and people in, people in authority and people who are victims. So I suspect I don't half, hear half of their stories. Participants also spoke about a community history of violence uh, and alcohol use. They explained how this has eroded into a current sense of what is normal for them and that it has become a way of being which continues to be passed on through generations and being socialized within the family and the community fiber. Participants also acknowledged that the expectation and acceptance of violence is one that trickles down to them as service providers. They, are, they become sensitized to the nature, the lethality, the frequency of violence that's occurring. An RCMP member had said, in my estimation, there is a prevalence of men and women in the North that think that domestic violence is just a part of daily life. And they have come to expect it and they have come to deal with it and the victimization continues. Another participant, a healthcare provider said, everybody knows, nobody says anything. Yet a contradiction to that is this idea of community gossip. Uh, women who are in violent relationships hesitate or remain silent for fear of community uh, reprisal if they do speak out about their relationship or access help. Women maintain this fear of retaliation from her family, from her partner's family, uh, from the community as a whole. This is, and shame and blame are a major piece of, of what, that, what that entails. A victim service wor first services worker had said, she talked about not being able to talk to her mother because her mother would take whatever she said. So spread gossip about her basically. And this woman didn't want to say anything to her mother because she knew it wouldn't be kept confidential. And then of course, his family was in total, in total support of him. So they would blame her if something had happened. And I remember thinking, this woman is gonna die. As a matter of fact, her sister was killed by her partner several years ago in a violent incident, and I just can't imagine her ever getting away. This speaks to family dynamics and the healing that is required in our communities. A social worker talked about the impact of community retribution. She had said that there's a lot of shame around family violence, and it's almost as if their cultural values around disclosing things that happen in the home could bring reper repercussions to members of the family as far as violence is concerned. And so whether that is real or perceived, I'm not so sure. But sometimes what I hear is that women are afraid to go forward, even to come to counseling, because then she will have told on them. That's the phrase we hear sometimes. Because when she gets back into the setting, she has to deal with the repercussions of having, you know, come forward. So sometimes it's difficult for her to even map her way through, even take that initial step. You know, there's a lot of pressure on her to be quiet. Women are also really encouraged to remain silent and accept violence because of their own or their families or their community's values of non-interference in relationships and also the commitment to your partner. The last major sub-theme within this culture of violence and silence is a woman's self-preservation. It could increase her experience of trauma to speak out about or to get help in her situation. And so for some women who don't come forward, it's a strength in terms of their ability to recognize uh, what they are or maybe what they are not capable of in that, in that moment in time. They're doing the best they can in that moment. And perhaps that means staying in the relationship even if it is violent. She's also trying her best to cope with this violent situation and sometimes recognizing that there isn't that much support for her. Maybe there is nowhere to go, there's limited resources, uh, fear of gossip or retaliation from the community. So again, she's doing the best she can in terms of coping with her situation and not coming forward. And perhaps that is the better option for her when she's weighing the personal consequences of that. A quote from the counselor, a counselor in our study had said, the intimate partner abuse is something that's kept quiet. It's not talked about amongst the community and that I think is partially self-preservation because this is when you're in a small community, you kind of have to keep the peace, you know? You don't want to go out of your way to make more crises in a culture where there's been enough. So the next major factor that contributes to this sense of ha your hands being tied as frontline workers is alcohol use. Earlier today, Pertis and I had actually spoken with, uh, had presented our project to the Yukon Women's Transitional Housing Society. 
and had a really interesting comment at the end of the presentation uh, and question about this slide in particular. Someone had asked why alcohol use didn't show up on the slide discussing social determinants of health. And we thought that was a really great question because it is a social determinant. Um, but what we got from our, from our data was that it really is its own factor in terms of contributing to frontline workers' sense of having their hands tied. Um, there was something that every single participant in our study over the last five years has noted whether it is understood as a contributing factor to violence from their perspective or a way of coping with the way of life in these communities, the participants in the study had acknowledged that people are heavy drinkers and that it's expected within the community. One participant had coined it as overt alcoholism. Uh, she said that for her it just captured this idea that alcohol use is, is everywhere it's seen. Um, it's, it's normal, as well as the means of acquiring it. It's just out and it's very prevalent and uh, bootlegging was an example she had used. A victim services worker who participated had said, uh, this community has such huge potential, so many good things about it, but it is mired in addictions and violence where people just can't get a step above it. So the reality of depleted resources in our community, when we look at um, women who are experiencing violence, and we put these numbers up on the slide pretty purposely, and they might be familiar to Lida <laughs> and a few others in the room. Um, what we really wanted to demonstrate today was what, what, it, what are depleted resources, what is the reality of this with women, and you had seen previously on that slide that violence is happening in every single community every single community in our territory, but what is not in the community? 33% of our communities do not have RCMP present. 79% of our communities have no victim services. And 85% of these communities don't have women's shelters. Um, an RCMP member in our study had said, there are no support systems in place as far as victim services. Victim services is located in the regional center, so the only services that can be provided are over the phone. And in my opinion, when victims are experiencing this kind of, tra this kind of trauma, you need one-on-one -on -one contact. Another RCMP member had said, it was almost two and a half years I was there in this community. Uh, there was no victim services worker. So what we did, because our policy says refer people to victim services, we called victim services and said, here's the situation. The victim doesn't have a phone at home. There's no victim services worker in town. So when we call them to notify them, that's the situation. But in reality, there's no help for them at all. A quarter of the people we work with in the community don't have a phone. There's no victim services worker in town. And if there was, it'd probably be somebody local that they may not trust because the rumor mill would go around. Part of this idea about having fewer resources includes the fact that community members are working in some of these frontline positions and it becomes a barrier for women to seeking uh, support. Uh, they may be related to that worker, uh, it might be a long time acquaintance for that woman. So this raises a lot of issues of trust and confidentiality for her. One of the victim services workers uh, provided an example. She said, I've had a problem where a worker on call is the mother or the aunt of the accused. It's very difficult. So when the woman finally gets to the point where she's going to do something about this fractured, abusive situation, the only person she can talk to is the relative of the accused playing for the other team. Lack of funding uh, came up consistently with participants. They explained that programs with shorter term funding or one-off opportunities, they had called it. One of our focus groups spoke quite a lot actually about this. Um, they spent a lot of their time talking about the funding issue um, in terms of it being a barrier for them to offer help and services. Uh, one of the quotes that came out of that discussion had said, and the other part too is that when we get funding to do creative things, give it to us for 10 years so we can actually know if it made a difference. These two-year models, we're just barely getting it going and then we're having to shut it down. So the actuality of services being offered to women um, who are experiencing violence in our territory. Participants acknowledged that the services that they are providing are ineffective. 
ineffective in being able to support women in violent relationships, ineffective in helping to reduce the violence from occurring, and also ineffective in providing regional outreach to communities in the larger catchment areas. They primarily describe the services as being crisis oriented, um, and they also describe themselves as working in silos or doing a bunch of patchwork um, rather than working together on it. They said that this, and really this idea of non-collaboration was a really prominent theme um, in our data. In one of the focus groups, a participant had remarked on this. She said, it was interesting, she was talking about a, one particular incident, and she had said, it was interesting to watch professionals talk to each other, working with this same family who didn't even know that they were working with the same family. There's something wrong with doing it that way. Some of the contributing factors that feed into this uh, non-collaborative way in which frontline workers are navigating their work um, is that uh, they, they actually don't have a great knowledge about what, what other services are out there, um, what the scope of those services might be, who's working in the positions of those particular agencies or programs at the time. So they don't have a really good handle on that. Another thing that they had noted was that they had a real fear of sharing information and exchanging information between agencies about women. Uh, one of our focus groups had described in detail how the ATIP information sessions actually created a fear amongst workers. Rather than giving them information about ways in which they can collaborate uh, while respecting the access and privacy policy. They discussed the barriers with having different policies between the agencies, forms, procedures, um, and that these will either slow down collaboration or at times even block it. Finally, when we think about what is actually happening with service providers and what the services are looking like, um, they said that they are working under heavy workloads, uh, heavy responsibilities beyond their job descriptions, and said that they take on multiple roles in their typical day, and really describe themselves as being a catch-all. So resilience and hope is our last contextual factor when we think about our hands are tied. And I think that this factor really speaks to two separate things. One is that the frontline workers who participated um, talked about their own hopes for communities of nonviolence and women's safety. They also spoke about um, their view of community people. They see resilience in the communities. They see resilience in the women. Um, they, they see women as being really strong and people who are persevering. So one uh, RCMP member had said, uh, we had this man in the community share his story and he used to drink a lot. He used to beat up his wife. It was just amazing to hear his stories of success and you could see that he was respected. The community had seen him at his worst and seen him through the transformation. You could see it in their eyes like, wow, if he could do it, maybe I could too. So now what? <laughs> um, so we, we have a whole bunch of new questions in our mind and also um, directions where we want to go um, with what we have come together and, and found. Um, and we've kind of categorized it into four major uh, section. So first when we look at research, um, though the project ha was able to capture incidents of violence um, in, a, in a point in time um, that we had shown you on that map, um, having statistics for incidents of intimate partner violence over a longer period of time is going to be a really valuable source of information for policymakers, for program developers, uh, for researchers. So we think that would be something worthwhile to pursue. Um, currently shelter workers, victim service workers and RCMP are using a screening tool to assess risk for women um, who are in an immediate and violent situation. It would be um, really interesting to investigate the effectiveness and utility of this tool, as well as the emergency protection orders that are being issued for women's safety. Another thing under uh, research is that, um, I mean, it is, it, and it is not going to come to anybody's surprise here, but it's really well known that our workforce in the north, particularly in the remote communities, is quite transient. Uh, we don't have any research that specifically considers this problem, uh, the impact it has on 
services for women who are experiencing violence, or the impact it has on the surface providers who are remaining in the communities or are new into the positions in communities. And then the other area would be looking at the cumulative effects of trauma uh, from intimate partner violence for women who are experiencing violence and children who are witnessing it. Uh, this could better inform the most effective interventions so, so that people can heal from their traumas and hopefully end this intergenerational nature of violence in our territory. And then finally, um, just recognizing this pervasive discourse of blame and shame in the language that is being used uh, by community people, by service providers, in the court system, in legislation. Conducting a discourse analysis of, the, analysis of these various systems could shed some light on ways in which we can shift those attitudes of violence being normal. When we think about practice, um, certainly one of the things that, we, that has come up is encouraging trauma-informed pra practice principles with frontline workers as well as within the court system, as well as highlighting, um, as well as, sorry, as well as identifying women sooner as opposed to having the predominance of frontline responses being very crisis-oriented. So this would include some research on an appropriate screening tool that could be used by, in the healthcare setting very routinely. Um, it also then would indicate that we need to have some sort of intervention pathway for frontline uh, workers who are using this instrument because they're going to want to know what do we do if a woman does acknowledge violence and does want to get some help. Um, and so we would want to make sure that there was a uh, really tangible, accessible intervention pathway for them. Another piece of practice is to initiate a coordinated response that includes sharing risk-related information, working collaboratively and in partnership to respond to intimate partner violence with an integrated unit. An interagency group out of BC is, has just released a best, best practice manual in uh, just last year regarding this, so it'd be really kind of interesting to follow up with that committee's work. Um, also, addictions are impacting families and communities. It's adding to the complexity of violence and it's making it more difficult to successfully intervene as frontline workers. Our participants suggested that violence is not going to change without a significant decrease in addictions. So having territorial uh, programs and more community-based support um, as well as residential treatment in the territory is needed. When we look at policy, uh, there's a significant need for adequate and consistent funding for programs that support women and families who are experiencing intimate partner violence, including shelters, victim services, community and land-based programs. Um, as Pertis had mentioned earlier, um, Lida Fuller, as a member of the Coalition Against Family Violence, had recommended to the Priorities and Planning Committee a funding formula for shelters that would ensure appropriate financial support to the four shelters outside of Yellowknife, and that is a great example of what we're talking about. Our findings also suggested that an in-house court support program for women be established as a way to offer outreach support in the time for women in the time between the charges being laid and, a, and their court appearance. Um, we also recognize that there's current work being done to look at the housing policies that become quite punitive for women in terms of leases and arrears if they are trying to leave a violent relationship. Uh, more needs to be done to ensure that these policies no longer act as barriers for women to access safety as well as establish safe housing. And then last, when we look at education, it, for example, some, some programming could focus on healthy relationships, parenting strategies, and healthy coping strategies for stress. We also need to increase violence education with frontline workers, uh, Crown, Defense, judges, and in the undergraduate health and social service programs, um, looking at evidence-based practice models, theories to explain violence, and integrating safety plans with women who are experiencing violence. Um, and lastly, to help move the community lens of violence as normal to one that recognizes a need for change and resistance to violence. Such campaigns as Gossip Hurts and Violence Hurts were suggested as possible ways in which we can create a shift within the territory and in the communities to no longer accept violence in intimate relationships. So we just wanted to conclude with a few thoughts that we've had um, that really are kind of at the forefront of our minds at this point of our project. 
uh, first and foremost, which has really been from the outset, is anonymity. <laughs> and it's interesting as being a practitioner to now feeling that as a researcher, anonymity in the North is challenging as a research issue and it's challenging for frontline workers. Uh, the GIS maps, these are, are really useful for decision makers and policy makers, so it was interesting to, to learn about them and, and ways in which we can use these to our advantage. Um, also, the normalization of violence needs to shift. Collaboration is essential amongst service providers and as well within levels of governance. Participants left these uh, interviews and focus groups saying we need tangible strategies. We need tangible strategies that are needed to assess and to address violence in both prevention and crisis uh, levels of intervention. And some of what's going on is really creative in terms of some of the interventions they're using, um, but they require support and they require permanency. Finally, uh, frontline workers are passionate, hopeful, overwhelmed, and frustrated, and they are searching for effective ways of helping. Hopefully, our findings will create paths of support for their efforts in the North to support women who are experiencing violence. Thank you. <laughs>